Hey everybody and welcome to the Plant Stock channel. Today it's Sunday and you know that means golden nugget time. I was cruising around on the net and I came across this great little nugget here. The origin story of Beyond Meat that was made over a year ago by a site called Entrepreneur. And this is a documentary or an interview that was created by Kristen Aldrich presented by the Cardone Ventures. Uh, and I gotta give them some credit for this, obviously. But it was really good and insightful. And as we know on this channel, for me, it's really important that the CEO of a company that you invest in is someone that you feel that you can trust, that you understand their vision, and it's a really good thing to understand their background. And that's what this video is all about. You'll understand the CEO, Ethan Brown, better. You'll understand his product even better. He does talk about also, is it actually as overly processed as people think? So again, you'll learn a lot from this video. When you finish watching this video, folks, let me know down in the comments. What did you think about this? Has your opinion about Ethan Brown or the products changed? I'm interested to hear. And as always, I would truly appreciate an early thumbs up since it does help spread the video. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, and you want to keep getting more information regarding Beyond Meat, Tattoo Chef, the very good food company, or other plant stocks, make sure to subscribe and don't forget that bell button. Throughout the ages, there have been those among us with the vision to see beyond the current paradigm. They break molds. They see instruments and hear music. They feel wind and take flight. Where we see plants, they see potential. They shift society, they move the masses, with the courage to do what others thought crazy or never dreamed possible. They chart a course towards the horizon and waters yet ventured and bring back to us a new reality. Simply put, they go beyond. As the founder and CEO of Beyond Meat, you are not only changing the game for plant-based protein, you are blazing the trail towards a more sustainable and ethical food choice. Take us back to your childhood. How did those experiences impact you? I am really fortunate that my why started very early for me. I did grow up in the city. I grew up in Washington, D.C. and in College Park, Maryland. My dad, who was a professor, he had grown up in rural New England and really loved it and wanted to have something to teach his kids about the outdoors, farming, and nature. So we spent a lot of time there as I was growing up, and that made a big impression on me. I just fell in love with the outdoors and the animals in general. But I did eat meat growing up, like most American kids, and, and really enjoyed it. Took my first date to McDonald's, I remember that. <laughs> and, uh, but I remember thinking as a kid, like, and there's something that I'm not comfortable with about this, because at that point I knew the animal, and once you know something, it's harder to disregard it. And so that was really a part of the change for me, was beginning to understand where my food came from and process it. In school, I was talking to my dad about what I should do with my life, and I remember he asked me an important question, what's the biggest problem you see in the world? And I said, well, I think the climate. And so I went out into the world and started working on clean energy. And that was really impactful and important to me, but it wasn't speaking in my heart in a way that it needed to. And I felt like there was a calling to which I was adjacent to. And so to get to the point where I could feel like I was answering that calling, I had to switch professions. For a long time, I labored under the assumption that it was really automobiles that were the biggest threat to climate, but also really important livestock. In fact, the numbers are bigger. Over time, I started to learn about this question. Can you fundamentally rebuild a piece of meat from plants? And the answer actually turned out to be yes. And so once I sort of figured that out, that you could do this, so let's go do it. To achieve anything extraordinary, it requires extreme effort. You really put everything you had into founding this company. In the early days, what would you say were some of your biggest obstacles and how did you overcome them? Now, I don't think I've ever shared this. People know that Bill Gates invested in this company. At the time he invested, I still had a ton of credit card debt. I had exhausted all my savings. So the night I was checking in in my hotel to meet with Bill the next day, my cards were being declined. <laughs> I was like, this is an absurd situation. Like, this is the, like the wealthiest man in the world. <laughs> and I'm not sure if I have a place to stay tonight. But when you put yourself under extreme financial stress and obligation stress, I mean, that's a big stressor. Other people believing in you, having given their money to you, uh, you do extraordinary things. 
you always create these boundaries where you're like, I'm never going to raid that savings account, or I'm never going to sell that house. And you ultimately end up doing it. And so you get yourself to the point where your back is so tightly against the wall that you have no choice but to go forward. And for me, that was really important because things do get really, really hard. I had to create the situation where you don't have an option. You've taken other people's money, you've left your job. So at that point, you have to persist. To me, that's just critical. If you have a place to fall that's soft, you do it. And so make sure that you set yourself up to succeed. Remove the opportunity to step down and take a break because you can't. Behind every mission-based entrepreneur lies a powerful purpose. So what are some of the problems that you're solving and why is this work so important to you? So I love this subject because it's something that's misunderstood about what we're doing. And there's two big misunderstandings. One is that we are sort of overly processed and that's something that I really want to take the time to help people understand how we actually make the product. And the second one is around, is this something that's beneficial to the American farmer or is it detrimental? The first one, what we're doing is we're essentially taking those core parts of meat directly from the plant. And so then we're, we're using heating, cooling, and pressure to restitch them into the form of muscle. We're applying those elemental forces to protein that we get from plants. So we start with pulses and legumes. We do that because the protein content's really good. And so we're always looking for amino acids and then we're looking for fats and then minerals and vitamins and of course water. And so for the protein right now, we use peas a lot, but we also use mung bean, we use sunflower seed protein, which I love. And if you think about color, like how do you affect the color of meat? We use things like beets and pomegranates. So in every case, we're trying to make these choices that are what's mom gonna feel really comfortable feeding to her kids? And it's really about that. Our guys and gals in the research department would get there a lot quicker if we allowed genetic modification, but we don't. And then on the question of agriculture, I love this question because this is an opportunity to bring a big revolution back into American agriculture. The University of Michigan did a study for us around the life cycle impacts on the environment from our production processes, and it was staggering the numbers that came back with. If we looked at, for example, land use, we used 93% less land to generate the same amount of beef that you would if you were raising cattle. And so that means that for 100 acres, the farmer can basically generate the same amount of income with seven acres that they used to with 100. So what are they going to do with the rest of that 93? They're going to make more money. And that's really what I'm trying to advocate for is, you know, let's stop growing corn, soy, and wheat to go through an animal. Let's grow protein directly. Let's help the American farmer make more money. And then you look at, you know, natural resources and then just the sheer amount of water, land, energy that goes into raising animals for, for meat. We used nearly half the amount of energy. 90% fewer emissions from a greenhouse gas perspective, and then 99% less water. And that's really our desire, right? Is to just lead the consumer towards something that's better for them and better for their families and the earth. What's not to love about that? If there is one thing you stand for, it's to go beyond, to break barriers, to defy convention, and to shatter expectations. Competitors are, of course, always entering the marketplace. How do you approach innovation? We approach innovation in an obsessive way. It's everything in our company. I'm constantly on soapbox about that. In fact, this morning I was writing an email to our team about reminding them that there are many companies in history that have not innovated quickly enough, have been relegated to second place, and so we never want that to happen. We spend a lion's share of our money on innovation, and we have a program here called the Beyond Meat Rapid and Relentless Innovation Program. And the purpose of that is to make our current products on the shelf obsolete. So if you're chasing us, you're chasing a ghost because we've moved on. If we take that approach and have that kind of manic sense of uh, urgency, uh, we'll stay ahead. Competition is good, it's great to have the sector growing, but we want to win, you know, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What we're doing is really important. It has a meaning well beyond our own lives. At the end of the day, you know, we look back on our lives and say, what did we do? If we can be that generation of people that have separated meat from animals. That's really meaningful. And I try to keep that at the forefront of everything we do. Always on the move, always pushing through. With their eyes squarely fixed forward, visionaries help us remember to not be prisoners of our past or victims of circumstance, but faithful in our future. To know that we have infinite capacity to solve any challenge we may face, no matter how large. To go beyond what is required. And to trust that everything will be okay in the end. And that if it's not okay, then it's not the end. We'll keep